afternoon, everyone. I'm Pamela Hastings, Relationship Manager here at Barometer Capital, and we thank you so much for joining us on another Barometer Readings webcast. Today is September 19th, and David Burroughs is traveling on the west coast of Canada. So joining us this afternoon is our very own Diana Abador, Head of Trading here at Barometer Capital. On today's webcast, we will provide you with a brief macro overview. And of course, at the tail end of Diana's conversation, we would be pleased to address questions on macro, sentiment, et cetera. So don't be shy. You can email me at phasting at barometercapital.ca or hit me up in the Q&A or the, or the chat via Zoom. And with that, I turn the conversation over to our one and only Diana Avador. Diana, Happy New Year. Welcome to another Barometer Readings. We are so pleased to have you join us. I know that our clients and uh, prospective investors really enjoy your insights uh, when you do get to join us. And of course, uh, you are eyes and ears 24-7 on our trading desk. So we're really looking forward to your macro overview this afternoon. Welcome to the program. Thanks, Pamela. And thanks, everybody, for joining me. Um... I want to give a little bit of a, an overview. It's a little different than what Dave does. As Pamela said, I head up the trading uh, at Barometer um, over our whole asset uh, class and the different asset classes. So please, if you have any questions that relate to anything sentiment related or what's going on, uh, boots on the ground right now, what's being priced in, to the market and that sort of thing, um, I most welcome your questions, any questions um, that you might have. Um, the theme of my presentation today is, I call it a balancing act. Um, balancing macro, balancing positive and negative uh, headlines, and balancing equally robust narratives about the economy. Um, because that, uh, the bottom line, that is kind of what going on. Sentiment is currently quite fragile and anxious, um, with the S&P 500 sitting near the low end of a multi-week uh, range and ahead of a multitude of central bank meetings in the coming few days, particularly, most importantly, the FOMC tomorrow will have um, the rate decision tomorrow at two o'clock and the press conference by Fed Chair uh, Powell. Uh, at 2.30. The TSX, however, which has been underperforming the S&P this year, is near the upper end of its range and is closing in on this underperformance um, throughout the last few weeks, but still kind of range-bound, as I will show. News flow has been relatively minimal, with uh, economic data holding in okay. Canadian unemployment numbers were excellent, though, and this is important. I've mentioned this in prior webcasts, and anytime I get an opportunity to talk, um, employment numbers are the single most important thing in the makeup of what's going on in the world today with the fastest rate hike regimen in recent memory. And um, you might scratch your head as to why the economy hasn't sputtered uh, more hard, hardly um, given the huge amount of rate cuts that we've had basically from zero to 5% in a relatively short time, short time relative to history. Um, so Canadian unemployment numbers are still good as are in the US and that is what's holding in, uh, holding everything together because as long as people have jobs, you have money to pay for goods uh, and can afford their mortgages, I'll make mortgages that are now uh, more expensive. Uh, we've had some tepid housing numbers. Everybody worries about the housing um, housing situation. And primarily, we have a robust set of opinions highlighting all the reasons why a soft landing will be achieved and also why it cannot. And markets have been trading range-bound throughout this discourse. Um, and we have a host of catalysts coming up. Like I said, all the central bankers uh, are going to be talking. But also September, October tends to be a more difficult time in the market and seasonally. And we've seen um, market participants front running this seasonality and selling down their portfolios in anticipation of weaker, um, weaker markets. So uh, market 
has kind of actually held in okay in the face of all that kind of selling. Um, flows have been positive uh, going all to all three major asset classes, including money market, bonds, and equities. Uh, but money market garnered the most amount of um, flows uh, of, of late. Um, there is a glimmer of geopolitical hope in the U.S.-China relationship, and importantly for the TSX, further oil gains, uh, which speaks to improving China demand, but also raises inflation risks. And finally, in our headline roundup, we have no material progress to either uh, the end of the UAW strike uh, or avoid a U.S. shutdown. This last couple of points will play into moderating growth into fourth quarter, which is important if we need a balance to hotter unemployment numbers, hotter retail sales, and higher commodity prices, which all can be inflationary. So that's why I call the theme of my presentation a balancing act, because we have some stronger numbers, hotter numbers, which give uh, impetus to the narrative that, uh, you know, we're going to, uh, central bankers are going to raise more and that's going to hurt markets. But on the other side, we do have data points that will balance that out and moderate. And so that plays into the softer landing scenario, which is what we've seen so far. Um, so let's get going with some pictures um, so you can see what I'm talking about. This is the S&P. And as you can see, it's in a holding pattern all the way from here. Uh, it rallied, pulled off, uh, nothing much going on at the index level. Of course, a lot has been going on under the hood, and particularly in the commodity um, and energy markets. Same with NASDAQ 100. This has been uh, the sector that has been most in the news and in play. You've all heard about how much NVIDIA has rallied and Meta, which is uh, Facebook and Amazon and how the market has been held up by uh, you know, the, the, the top uh, six or seven horsemen and how breadth in the beginning of the year um, all the way up here has actually uh, had a lot of stocks not participating until it, it did start to a little bit. And now actually our short-term indicators are uh, pretty negative in this little sell-off as technology has started to lose some ground um, relative to all else. The TSX, I've shown this chart in our previous presentation um, and I've extended it today. Um, this is still range bound, lots of gap. You can see that it's pretty erratic. It looks erratic to the eye. Um, you know, TSX is not really a reflection of the Canadian economy as it is so overweight and materials and, com and and energy and banks, really. If you have any of those work, the TSX does okay, except that there's been a lot of rotation. And, um, and uh, so, uh, you know, it, it kind of held every time something rallied, something else sold off. Financials have not participated all that much. And we have yields in the banks that are now skirting, you know, five and 6%, which is, which is quite nice. Um, this is a chart I took out from Bank of Montreal. Um, they're saying that, that we are hitting some kind of resistance. It's a technical chart. People look at technicals a lot. Um, a breakout here, they say, shifts the long-term trend back to bullish and opens the door for a challenge of all-time highs. And the reason I'm stating this, particularly to the TSX, is because there has been one particular theme that has really worked throughout this balancing act, throughout this range bound market. And that has been oil. Oil has gone from $75 to $95. And if it continues to be strong, um, we can hope that the TSX um, can break out of its range and, uh, and take it higher. And there's some, some rotation into that. As I will show in the flows, technology has been losing some of the, some of the, oomph and some of the, the flow um, that kept it up. Brent oil um, touched highest since November and WTI as well. Um, this is supply uh, related strength. Um, the Saudis and Russia curb supplies. So there is a bit of a supply issue here. And this comes at exactly the time 
that the strategic petroleum reserve in the U.S. Um, is is at its lows. Now, the U.S. is in a little different situation than it has been when the strategic petroleum reserve first started. The U.S. now is a net exporter. It has enough of its own oil. So some argue that the SBR does not need to be replenished, uh, but we'll see. Uh, OPEC data in indicates a growing uh, supply shortfall. Um, you know, OPEC is not always um, as straightforward as you might think. They like to cheat. Um, they say they will not supply, and they do. But for now, um, the world believes that there is a bit of a supply, and that's kind of what took oil to the levels that it has. would also mention that Commodities are a reflationary asset. And, um, you know, the sectors that have been working in the market are those that are reflationary. Um, this oil strength is particularly incredible. Um, this is the US dollar. It is at a 10 month high and it is at an inflection point. And as the dollar has gained strength over the last two months, stocks have been struggling to advance. Uh, consolidating much of the gains and stuck in a choppy sideways trading range. Um, this impressive recovery in the dollar after hitting year-to-date uh, year lows in June um, has climbed over 5% due primarily to good news, a stronger than expected U.S. economy, and but higher for longer monetary policy from the Fed. Despite the recent recovery, investors remain Increasingly bearish on the dollar, the U.S. dollar, speculative net positioning in the dollar recently fell to a two-year low. So the dollar is at an inflection point. We'll see if it breaks out or not. A lot of this might depend on tomorrow when Fed Powell speaks. The expectation is that they won't do anything. Uh, they will not raise rates. But to balance that out and to keep themselves optionality, uh, we expect the narrative at the press conference to be quite hawkish because they do want to keep a window open to do uh, whatever they need to do. And by the way, I would just offer an opinion here. In my experience, um, central bank narrative has not had any predictive value, anything beyond you and me. They also follow the data and see what we see. If you just take it back to 2018 when Fed Powell said, there's going to be rate hikes and he's going to rate, he's going to raise rates. Uh, 2019 ended up being with three or four rate cuts. So, um, you know, also in, you know, 2022, Fed funds expectations were to be closer to zero. They ended up at like 4%. So they also follow the data, whatever hawkishness he may offer tomorrow, we're going to have to take it with a grain of salt and make our own decision. Chinese economy, I always bring this up when I talk about our markets because the TSX is really dependent on this. We need a Chinese economy that consumes, that buys oil and copper and iron ore. And um, the Chinese economy is not doing too, too well. However, um, this will likely prompt the Chinese officials to stimulate they already lowered required reserve ratio. That's a de facto rate cut last Thursday. And that was the third one this year. So, um, you know, and there is geopolitical issues between them and the U.S. and import export numbers that are not as robust as they used to be, as there is, you know, there is a move away from uh, globalization and everybody's protectionist and tariffs. And by the way, Biden never did cut any of the tariffs that Trump has put in place, despite everybody screaming that Trump was wrong for, for doing that. And, you know, it's it's not right. And um, none of that went away. So those tariffs are still there. Um, and it's actually uh, impacting their import export numbers. Um, not to mention that um, demographically, the Chinese economy, uh, if we look ahead to like 2040, 2050, their one-child uh, policy has actually created a situation where their demographic situation is to decline. And 
you know, India's um, uh, India's population will actually expect it to be higher than the Chinese population by 2050. So there's all those dynamics going on, and it's important. And we have um, Ukraine Russia war where Russia has had sanctions, and you see the Chinese um, gathering up oil. I'm sure um, from cheaper um, cheaper Russian oil that they are able to get their hands on. Um, one of the things that, um, you know, market activity, uh, despite all these um, negative and positive news with the economic data and the negative out of, um, out of China, um, we do have market activity that despite being range bound uh, and not being able to decide what to price in next, um, and August activity was lackluster in volumes, and September tends to be seasonally weak. Market did start to absorb new IPO activity, which is the main reason markets exist, um, to create capital formation for businesses, to expand and invest, which trickles down to the economy as a whole. So this is good to see. It's good to see that the market is now opening up to accept um, new IPOs, we had um, Arm uh, Arm Holdings priced at uh, fifty one dollars and is trading today at fifty five. And uh, Instacart, which some of you might know because you use it for deliveries, priced at um, thirty dollars today and uh, and opened up at forty two and then sold to about thirty five dollars. So it's good that the market absorbs these IPOs. Enbridge did a really big deal. Um, which uh, priced well and is trading above it. So those are actually, from my perspective, um, interest and activity and good lubrication in the market when you start being able to move merchandise into the market and there is demand and, and money to, to absorb it. Um, just for fun, I have this Instacart chart. Um, you know, private equity, uh, we all know, has been um hurt a little bit over the last year and a half. Um and Instacart um was at a valuation of 39 billion in 2021. They came to market today at a 10 billion valuation, which is a 74% haircut. And these are all the investors and all the pricing that they paid. Uh, all the, these are all private private capital companies. Um, anybody that invested over 2018 is underwater in today's um, in today's IPO. So um, yes, there's a stock coming to market, but yes, it's coming at a discounted price, um, which you know it sounds not great, but it is great because I would rather um, invest in a company at thirty dollar valuation. And 125, 125 would have been just too expensive, and, um, and 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 the possibility of loss there would have been much much higher. So, um, and by the way, on private equity, um, there's lots of cash on the sidelines in the private equity markets, because in the past ten years we have seen a demo democratization of this market. Um, it could act as a stabilizer at some point. Um, as money is looking for investment and put a bit of a, uh, a floor on valuations, which would trickle into public markets as well. In terms of um, moving over to economic uh, numbers, as I said, this is the most important macro data. Uh, it's unemployment in the US, Canada looks similar. It's still very low um, and it's coming into balance from being very hot you had high quit rates because of the confidence of finding another job quickly it is now more moderate. So um, people looking for work and people offering work are more in balance than they used to be when the unemployment is still fairly low. We can afford having it move up a little bit and still call this um, a soft landing. So um, that that is a good thing. Global manufacturing PMIs, this is something that uh, market participants um, on macroeconomics watch a lot. It really has come off its highs quite substantially. This gives 
central bankers or help central bankers stay put. And this is why I mentioned in the beginning of my presentation that this is a balancing act. You have strong numbers, which would be inflationary, but you have a balance. You have certain data that offsets that um, some pricing data that's coming coming out that balances the strength. And this is what we want to see. We want to see a balance because we want to see the soft landing. Canadian CPI reported this morning. I added the slide in last minute. Um, it was hot. And it went from here, this little blip here, to a little blip here. I don't know if you can see my cursor. I hope you do. But so people are worried about this. And they're worried about the Canadian Central Bank raising rates again on a Canadian consumer that truly can't afford it. However, it has come down substantially. I'm hoping that the central bank um, leaves it alone a little bit because rate hikes take a while to filter in through the economy. And we do have um, housing, um, housing situation numbers. Prices have not come down a lot. But um, we had housing numbers coming out uh, in the U.S., like housing starts and NHA, uh, NAHB data. Um, and um, that was pretty, pretty weak. Um, CIBC noted that the resurgence of inflation in Canada was not confined to energy, although energy was an input, because like I said, it went from 75 to 95 but all eight major categories were rising at an annualized rate um, that was above the Bank of Canada target. So this priced in today, uh, expectations have for a rate hike in Canada uh, at their next meeting went from just 25% to 50%, but we still have a lot of data to digest before the Canadian Central Bank meet. So we'll see if this balancing act continues properly. Um, Goldman Sachs, um, says that, and this is one of the moderators in the strength of the data, and I put it right behind the CPI so I can juxtapose this. Uh, Goldman Sachs thinks that there are three developments to temporarily slow the growth in fourth quarter. Um, one is the resumption of student loan payments, which they calculate as a half a percent drag to the GDP number. Uh, federal government temporary shutdown which is a 0.2% uh, per week drag on GDP. And then we have reduced auto production and manufacturing from the UAW strike, which calculates to 0 0.05 uh, to 0 0.10 tiny percent per week though. So the longer it lasts, the longer they take to um, get them back to work, um, the longer, the, the more it impacts the GDP. And then, of course, officials will be looking at the outcome, which is how much uh, wage growth have they managed to win and that sort of thing. And that, that will play into the employment wage data. So um, the good thing is that one-year expectations for inflation have come down quite substantially. And this is a self-fulfilling cycle. Um, if you expect prices to go up in the future, you spend now. And if you think that inflation is stabilizing or coming down, you might not run out and buy um, that item that you um, hope uh, might come down in price. And you don't feel this fear of missing out if you don't buy it now, because tomorrow it'll be more expensive. So inflation expectations are very, very important. Um, and they've been um, cutting down. And this is the stuff, toughest stage of the central banks um, that they have to face right now. On the one hand, um, the rapid rate hikes take some time to filter into the economy, um, but um, you know, um, inflation expectations are coming down, rates are high. We've seen the housing numbers have come down. That points to a sharp deterioration in builder sentiment, exactly as consumers have a hard time affording a home and exactly at a time when supply of housing is too low. So this is a tricky time. Um, I mentioned China. Um, 
China market has not done very much, but it's below its key technical levels, but it's nearing its um, support level around here. So um, we'll see, we've already started to see signs that the Chinese officials are uh, starting to try and stimulate their economy. Um, so data is moderating, but it's good. The current situation does point to a soft landing. Um, it's awful to say that it's different this time, so I won't, but I would bring to mind that the rate regimen we are currently experiencing is sort of a normalization from the great financial crisis. Um, zero rates are not normal, 5% are normal. It's just happened very fast, and we've had two decades of low rates, so a lot of people don't remember what it's like, but um, it is normal. Um, flows have been supportive of normal course of business. Uh, they're favoring money market right now. However, our short-term indicators are fully negative, and the market could experience a 3 or 4% weakness to August lows, um, but one which I think would likely be bought. The IPO and bond issuance calendar has been more robust than one would expect, so that is a, a, a good thing. Uh, tech flows have been negative, um, and they've rotated into small cap uh, and money market and, um, and energy. Um, that has been a very strong sector, and uh, when I show our portfolios, I will show you that we've, uh, we've um, uh, added to that sector, and we're now overweight. Um, global fund flows, uh, bonds and cash um, have been rallying as people are okay with their 5% yield. Uh, equities have received some cash as well, but uh, throughout this um, market range-bound situation, they've kind of remained flat. Barometer portfolio exposures. Um, we are overweight um, energy. Um, and financials because of the yield, because of its outperformance. Um, we are underweight now healthcare. And we're overweight materials. Uh, we sold down our discretionary by selling the home builders. And we're still underweight tech, but at 18%, we have a few um, holdings that are um, the best of the best in technology. Um, and we increased our commodities uh, exposure and energy exposure, Suncor, Tech B. Um, we are cautious, however, if you add up the bonds and the cash, we're at around 12%. And our corporate bonds are 7.8%, which, you know, I know are corporate and they're different than a government bond. So maybe they're not cash cash, but they're very safe and there's very low duration. And then finally, I just want to leave you with this. This is a bit of trivia. One dollar from 1800 is worth just four cents today. But if the same dollar was in stocks, it would be 2.3 million today. All I want to say here, this is a cocktail party uh, headline. But all I want to say here today is that equities are still your best inflation hedge. So um, I think that if we manage it tactically properly into sectors that are reflationary, markets are holding in, and uh, we're watching the economic data uh, quite carefully, uh, we will have a chance to properly position portfolios should this not work. Thank you for listening. And if you have any questions at all, I'm happy to answer. Hey, Diana, thank you so much for hosting again. We really appreciated it. It uh, looks like we don't have any questions coming through today. So um, we will leave the conversation there. Look forward to welcoming everyone back next week. And uh, it's always a pleasure to have you and your insights uh, from our trading desk on the program. So with that, Wishing everyone a wonderful evening. Thank you, Diana, and look forward to seeing everybody alongside David Burroughs back here, same time, same place next week. Thanks, everyone. Thank you very much. Thanks for listening. Pleasure. Bye.